All right. I, I must say it is an honor to be here, and, and I'm also humbled to be in the presence of, of, of some pretty, pretty significant people that are in the room as well. So um, uh, as far as this sort of pre, uh, pre-conference workshop, I've geared my lecture uh, so that it's sort of a broad overview, and it's geared not specifically to physician level folks. So it's, uh, it's sort of give us an overview for the lay person as well, because we do have some lay people in the audience, some lay divers who are not physicians in training. So I apologize if any of it's below uh, sort of um, uh, level of sophistication, but hopefully we can sort of discuss the practical aspects, at least from the point of view of an emergency physician, which I am, and a hyperbaric physician on how we manage, uh, how, to, how we try to diagnose and manage diving accidents, uh, specifically actually DCS is what we're going to be talking about. All right, so I, I, my conflict of interest statement, I have no um, uh, financial relationships or conflicts, conflicts related to the talk. Um, all right, so uh, eventually, uh, when someone suffers uh, decompression sickness, they're probably going to wind up, at least in the United States, in an emergency department, and somebody like me might be there trying to figure out what to, or one of my colleagues is going to be trying to figure out what to, what to do to take care of you and figure out what's wrong. So the, one of the very important things to remember when it comes to decompression sickness is that it is one of the true clinical diagnoses. What do we mean by that? We mean that there are no, there's no tests that I can do on you that can prove that you have decompression sickness. Okay? It is a true clinical diagnosis. Um, and what, as with all diagnoses, but specifically the ones that are clinical like DCS, the story will become critically important. You have to get the information. You have to perform the very thorough history um, to figure out what's going on and whether or not this diver that you're seeing is likely to have DCS or not. Okay? Uh, in addition, you have to do a very thorough physical exam, especially we're going to talk about the neurological exam. You have to pick up the deficits, which may be subtle, but if they're there, you need to identify them because that will help you make the diagnosis, but also give you a target to shoot for when you treat and you want to resolve those symptoms so it gives you something to follow as you go through. Okay. And uh, one thing also to remember when we're sort of standing in the emergency room is that we have to create a differential diagnosis. And DCS is one of these conditions that has many diseases that can be similar to it. A lot of mimickers. So DCS is the great mimicker. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind in that uh, just because a diver's been diving doesn't mean that they're suffering from a diving related illness and they can have other medical problems that are wrong with them. Okay. So, uh, Again, from the layperson's point of view, or a diver who shows up to the emergency department and may be injured, they're going to sort of meet the emergency physician, right? So the, the, the doctor meets the diver, okay? Um, one thing to remember, at least I can attest to this having been trained in the United States, is that emergency physicians and any physician, unless they've sought out specific training in underseeing hyperbaric medicine, know little to nothing about it. It's not taught in medical school, and it's not taught very well in emergency medicine residency programs, which I went through. Okay, uh, and that the diver themselves who comes in may know more about diving physics and physiology than the doctor who's trying to treat them. Okay, so and when you, when you're working as a hyperbaric physician and you get the call from an ER doc somewhere, you may need to sort of you'll figure out early on in the conversation how much they do or don't know, and then you'll have to figure out how to collect the information you need to decide what to do with that patient. Okay. Um, that the, the ER physician, because of that possible lack of knowledge, is going to need help in obtaining the information um, about the events leading up to the injury because, like we said, the story is going to be very important in helping make the diagnosis. Um, and they'll especially need help when it comes to getting the diving details. If that doctor is not a diver or has never been trained, they're going to have a lot of trouble with that. One of the things I'll wind up doing is very early on in a conversation, I'll decide whether I need to keep talking to the ER physician or tell them to just put the patient on the phone. Okay, so, right, and, and I, I, I do that all the time. I say, I start asking questions and they, I, I get the pregnant pause, and then I say, hang on a second, can you just take the phone, you know, can you get the phone to the diver, and then I can have a diving conversation, and then I've had the, the patient actually had their dive computer and I'm talking about what their dive computer says on, on there, so that we can decide what happened, and I can get the story over the phone before I decide on transfers or what to do, so. That's an important aspect of it as well. Okay, so is this sort of the diving history, the important things that we need to know that the emergency physician's probably not going to know what to ask. Uh, includes, you know, how experienced is the diver? Um, were they breathing any 
funky gas mixtures, okay, whether you're breathing straight up air or any different gas mixtures. Um, I, I'll, I'll have a very proud ER physician say, diver was diving 55 feet for 43 minutes. And I go, were there any dives before that? Oh. <laughs> they go, hold on. And then they start going back and forth, and then I just say, put the diver on. Um, so they will not have known to ask about repetitive diving or if they were, the diver was doing any special dives, like decompression diving or anything like that. Were they using special equipment? Is this a diver who was breathing a constant partial pressure oxygen rebreather? Well, then that changes the story, right? So that becomes a very different sort of situation of gathering information. So special equipment that may have been used. And then this one is tricky because you're trying to get it from the ER physician, but you also have to tease it out from the diver is a diver may be embarrassed to, to uh, come clean that they had a problem during the dive or they made a mistake or they did something wrong. And it's important to sort of be, be nice about it and get them to come up with that information for you because it will help you make the diagnosis. If there was a, you know, something happened, my mask got knocked off and I had a rapid ascent to the surface, you know, that, that will change what you're doing when you're figuring out your differential diagnosis. And then, of course, the description and timing of onset of symptoms becomes very important when we're talking about trying to diagnose decompression sickness. All right, so, um, <laughs> We mentioned it before, and actually, I had, um, we had a good, early, good question earlier about dive computers, and uh, Dr. Strauss did a good job of explaining dive computers as well. One thing I'd like to sort of, when I talk about dive tables and dive computers is, remember that, and I have to tell divers this, the dive table, the dive computer, is not a I'm bent, not bent um, phenomenon. A dive computer or a dive table is a, it's a risk management tool, okay? Dive tables and dive computers have an acceptable level of DCS. If you dive that computer right up to the edge, they expect one to 5% of those dives to result in decompression sickness. So you get divers who say, well, I was, you know, I was within the range of my computer, but understand that the closer you get to the maximum of what your computer will allow you to do, the higher the risk that you're gonna get decompression sickness. So dive computers don't protect you from that. But the re reason I show you this slide is that you got to get the dive computer, especially in modern times. Almost everybody is diving with dive computers now. Um, 30 years ago, everybody was diving with dive tables. So you could ask depth and time profiles, and you could get information from that. Now, when the ED doc is proud of themselves and tells me what the depth and the time were, if that diver was diving with a dive computer, I can't go to my tables and figure that out because this most likely was a multi-level dive. I need to get the information from the dive computer. Dr. Strauss did a good job. He showed you a picture of what, what you get printouts from those dive computers, shows the actual dive profile, but then depending on the algorithm the dive, dive computer uses, it shows you tissue loading. So you can get an idea of how much decompression stress that dive had attached to it or those series of dives had attached to it so that you can get an idea of do you think this these dives were significant enough to give these person these symptoms or were they well, well within limits and it may not be DCS. So you have to put all this stuff together, okay? <clears throat> all right, um, symptoms of decompression sickness. A lot of us are divers in the room and we've just had lectures about it, so I don't think I have to go into a, a ton of detail, um, but we tend to separate them into mild and serious symptoms. Um, uh, however, um, we, talk, we, we don't blow off mild symptoms and mild symptoms can progress to become serious, but, um, and, and Nick did a good job of, of explaining the, the, the difference between the serious symptoms and, and uh, mild symptoms in his earlier talk. But one of the things is um, we really have to be aware of the neurological symptoms because that is gonna be what you're gonna be finding where the deficits are, and you have to, you have to get those symptoms out. So we, Nick had listed, a, did a pretty good list of all those neurological symptoms. These are just some of them. Right, and the final, the final pathway in severe, you know, whenever I got lectures in med school, the end was seizure, coma, death, right? That's what happens to you at the end. So, um, uh, however, these are things that you're sort of looking for, these neurological symptoms uh, that are very significant to identify um, in a diver who may be suffering from decompression sickness, okay? This is the, you may recognize this from Nick's talk. This is stolen from the US Navy from when they did their trials on divers who actually got bent and they were watching them get bent. And uh, again, when we talk about straight up DCS, it can be more insidious in that the symptoms may not come on immediately. They may be more gradual, but the majority of the symptoms will occur within 12 to 24 hours. So I always get a diver who said, I was diving two weeks ago. 
and today I got some elbow pain, I'm pretty sure that I have decompression sickness. Well, then you have to have a discussion with that diver about what's going on. It's not likely to be the case. Important to remember that um, when you talk about cerebral arterial gas embolism, which is a different entity, symptoms will almost always be immediate or within minutes of a dive happening, as opposed to DCS, which is much more insidious and more difficult to figure out. All right, so, so the physical exam, you know, this, is the, this is the diver gets nervous when they see this, right? So I'm going to the emergency room, what's the doctor gonna do to me when I get there is, is what their question's gonna be, all right? But when we do the physical exam as physicians, uh, it's gonna be very important, and we had a member of the audience talking about getting that neurological exam. And I often have to, being an ER doc, I know that sometimes we do things kind of quick and fast and not as thorough as we should. So when I talk to ER docs, I'll actually sort of badger them into going back and completing their neurological exam because they almost always di didn't do the whole thing. So I try to get those deficits figured out. In addition to that, I think our, I saw a pile of these out. This is the field neurological exam that I think are provided as part of the course or they're out there for people to see. Um, these, so the field neurological exam is even good for the lay divers, and Dan teaches courses to lay divers about doing a quick field neurological exam, which can be very helpful when I'm the treating physician. If this thing shows up, I can say, oh, this is what symptoms this diver had when they first came out of the water, because I'm only seeing my little piece of time. I'm not seeing the evolution of what's happened from the beginning to the end. So things like these field neurological exams can be very well if the checkbox is checked, or you can talk to the people who did that field neurological exam, it's gonna help you. So as physicians, we all know what the pieces of a neurological exam are. Um, and then some of the ones that we have to badger the ER docs into doing is to pick up those sort of uh, specific deficits. Um, I will talk about, uh, where did that slide go? Uh, tests of balancing coordination. Okay, so I'll talk about that part of it in just a second. Um, in the emergency department, we'll also get some tests and studies done. But in the very beginning of this talk, I told you that it's just a clinical diagnosis and there's no test that proves decompression sickness. So why are we doing all these tests? Anybody? Exactly, so, right, so we're running through a different, so the answer was we're looking for other things, right? Because we know that something else could be wrong. So we're doing a lot of these tests to make sure that something else may be wrong with that patient and we don't wanna just take them to the chamber when they're having a stroke or they're suffering from something else. So those are what those tests are for. The chest X-ray is very important because I'm not gonna put anybody in my hyperbaric chamber, especially a diver who's just been diving, unless I've screened them for a pneumothorax first because I can do more harm than good if I put them in the chamber with an untreated pneumothorax. All right, um, so uh, I thought I put, okay. My slides are out of order for some reason. I apologize for that. Um, echocardiogram is listed on here as a test that can be done. Um, why in a situation where you have a diver would you get an echocardiogram? And you probably won't get it in the acute setting. You'll get it later on, depending on the story. Anybody know why you'd want to get an echocardiogram or a special type of echocardiogram? Yeah, so I, I kind of gave it away, right? So I showed you the PFO thing. So, and, and we may talk about that maybe off uh, a little bit more this, week, this weekend for the course. So tests of balance and coordination that are important. Um, so these are the ones that you want to do. Um, a lot of people, of uh, those of us who are physicians, know what a finger-nose finger is, rapid alternating movements, heel-shin, that type of thing. We all know what a Romberg is, um, although if you have a patient or diver who's suffering from vertigo or a loss of coordination, the, the test that's best for me um, to not only identify a deficit but follow to resolution is a test called a sharpened Romberg. Anybody ever heard of a sharpened Romberg before? So only a few people have heard of what a Sharp and Romberg is for. Nick, can you come up and you're gonna help me demonstrate a Sharp and Romberg. If you stand right in front, you'll be in the video so we won't get in trouble with those peeps. All right, so in a Sharp and Romberg, I'll talk through it, Nick knows what it is, but what you're gonna do is, so in a Sharp and Romberg, you're going to stand uh, as if you're walking on a balance beam, one foot in front of the other, and then you're gonna put your arms across your chest. You can make the room dark if you want, and then you're gonna have the diver close their eyes. And then when they do that, you're gonna hit your stopwatch and you're gonna time it, okay? A normal person should be able to hold, we'll see if Nick's normal, should be able to hold a sharpened Romberg for at least 40 to 45 seconds, that's normal. If you can't hold it, you'll get a time that's less than that. If the sharpened Romberg is abnormal, so that, thanks Nick, you, you held it for long enough, so you're normal. Uh, 
So what the Sharp and Romberg does is not only does it tell me that a test is abnormal, I can test that again later on, and I can watch if my treatment is effective, watch that Sharp and Romberg time get back up to normal again. And I've used that multiple times before. So it's a great test of balance and coordination that you can get a, instead of a plus minus like you get with a Romberg, it's normal or abnormal, you have a degree of abnormality for which you can follow. All right. Um, anybody heard of Unterberger tests? You gotta, you gotta throw out all this goofy stuff. Do you know the Unterberger tests? Okay, so the Unterberger test is, is a funny test. Uh, it it kind of works. So if somebody has vertigo of a peripheral origin, vertigo that's caused by a problem with your, uh, your inner ear space, what you have someone do in, in a uh, Unterberger test is they'll put them in the, in the room, they're gonna have them put their arms in front of them, they're gonna close their eyes and they're gonna march in place. When they march in place, if they have a problem with peripheral vertigo, they'll rotate towards the affected side. So you can at least try to identify where the lesion is. So Google, Google Unterberger later tonight if you want to. There's an online thing that shows you what it is. And that helps you identify where it is. So you can like, uh, impress the medical students when you tell them what an Unterberger is if you want to. So I, sometimes I'll do that in a, in a diver who has vertigo to try to fi figure out what's going on. And tandem gait and that kind of stuff. I apologize for that. Okay, so, uh, so doctor or detective, so you have to become sort of house, right? So you're on an episode of house trying to figure out what's wrong with this diver that's come in. D anybody ever see, there was an episode of house about DCS. Did anyone ever, did anyone see that episode? So it's great, great episodes. Y y if you find it, you gotta find it. So the scenario is this, I have to digress just for a second. So uh, the scenario is this, is uh, Cuddy and house were, in, were away at a medical conference somewhere in the Far East or something. Uh, and they were flying home in an airplane. And this guy, this young guy, gets sick on the airplane. He, he has altered mental status. He, has, he can't maintain his balance or coordination. And, and House is running through his differential diagnosis, and he does a spinal tap with like a pen cap or something <laughs> to collect some cerebral spinal fluid. And then at the very end, he's going through the guy's wallet and finds his diver certification card. And then he makes the clinical diagnosis, and then he f gets the information from the diver that he had indeed been diving right before he got on the airplane. And he made the diagnosis of DCS, and he told the, the pilot to fly low so the airplane's like go, going across the tops of buildings and stuff, and he, he saves the day, all right? So even in-house, we can get, DC, you know, here's your clinical diagnosis of DCS. All right, but, but again, it's a clinical diagnosis. We have to be thorough in our history taking, uh, get our physical exam findings, do our tests, and do our differential diagnosis, which can be very daunting. And here's some of the suspects that you're gonna be looking for that may be trying to mimic decompression sickness. Now, if people have, are having a problem relation to diving, they probably have been on a dive trip. So what are dive trip related problems that can try to trick you and look like decompression sickness? Well, here's a list of them. So, and you got to keep these things in the back of your mind, and you may want to ask these questions. So, could they have gotten contaminated gas source? Okay. So, what questions do you ask about that? You ask, uh, was anyone else having the same symptoms? Because if everybody was getting the same gas supply, some other people may be having similar symptoms. Um, is this a diver who was skip breathing or hyperventilating, uh, which can cause symptoms like that? Is this a diver who've had trouble equalizing their ears um, during a dive and could manifest as, as uh, symptoms related to vertigo for that, from that? Could they have been envenomated with a blue ring octopus, possibly, depending on where they were diving? Sea sickness can do it. And there's a couple of classic foodborne illnesses that try to mimic themselves as DCS. Does anyone know two, it was a good test for the audience, two Foodborne illnesses. Now, when you go on a dive trip, right, you're diving near the ocean, what do you usually eat on your dive trip? Seafood, right? So there's two seafood-related uh, foodborne illnesses that will, will be very tricky and try to manifest as DCS. One is ciguatera poisoning, okay? So when you eat fish from the red tide thing and it gives you these funny neurological symptoms. And the second is paralytic shellfish. Okay, so you can you can get it from you can get it the, the from from eating the shellfish as well. Okay, so those are two of those. Now I didn't originally put immersion pulmonary edema on my list of things that would mimic DCS, but I had to put it on here because I have to tell you about a case that we had last summer, which sort of drives me crazy. So we have a quarry uh, up no about an hour north of us where divers go diving, and there was a diver who was diving 
And what happened to her was that during the dive, she developed acute shortness of breath while she was underwater diving, came up to the surface, was significantly hypoxic. When the EMS arrived, she, was, she had an oxygen saturation of about 80%. She was taken to the local emergency department who said she was diving. They transferred her from one hospital to another that had just gotten their monoplace chambers put in, and they had a doctor trained in hyperbaric medicine there who said, this diver was diving, I need to treat them with hyperbaric oxygen. Treats the patient with hyperbaric oxygen, patient does not get better, gets a little bit worse, and then they call us at eight o'clock at night saying, we don't understand, we treated this diver, why'd they get worse? And the diagnosis was immersion pulmonary edema which is not an indication for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So I, I had to put it up there because they did it. So if I didn't have an actual case, I wouldn't have put that up. All right. Um, so now we got our diving related stuff that you have to keep in mind could have happened and could be causing symptoms. But then don't forget as a physician that you still have to be practicing medicine and there's a list of medical conditions which can, ma which can manifest with similar symptoms, including uh, you know, certain infections, um, uh, you, you know, migraine headaches, stroke-like symptoms, those kind of things are listed there, including all the goofy ones like Meniere's and Guillain-Barre, which you have to keep in mind as well. That's why you have to do your thorough uh, exam, get your thorough history, and collect all your information to put it all together and figure out what you're going to do, okay? So treatment, Nick talked about it a little bit before, and it, it ain't rocket science, right? So what we're going to do here is uh, you got a diver, they, the first thing is oxygen. Again, I'll get the ER doc who says, they dove to 53 feet, they were there for 35 minutes, you know, and they give me a story for DCS and I go, do you have them on oxygen? You go, oh. <laughs> so you need to get, get them on oxygen right away. So if treatment of, treat, the treatment, uh, initial treatment needs to be oxygen right away. More often than not, these divers will be dehydrated and they're gonna need fluids. They need it orally or you can put it in through the IV. And then there is some literature to suggest that non anti-inflammatories will provide benefit in the setting of DCS. So if you would like to, you can add some NSAIDs. Other than that, and a lot of other things have been looked at, including steroids and other things that have shown no benefit for the treatment of decompression sickness. So that's what you got for your first line treatments. And then if, if we're pretty sure or we're worried about DCS, uh, the treatment is going to be getting them to a definitive care hyperbaric oxygen treatment. All right, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, primary treatment for DCS and CAGE. Those are the only two diving-related conditions which require hyperbaric oxygen therapy. That's it. No other diving. If they don't have DCS and they don't have CAGE, they don't go to the hyperbaric chamber. End of story. And that's the thing that we have to teach the emergency room physicians. Um, like uh, Nick said, sometimes we'll be doing this kind of thing, right, trying to make the diagnosis. And what we will often do to help make the diagnosis is do what we call a trial of pressure. We're going to say, you know, you got an okay story. We're not sure what's wrong with you, but we're going to put you in the chamber and assess your response to treatment. So that's what we do in a case of trial of pressure, which sometimes will help us make the diagnosis. So we'll do the trial of pressure. Uh, again, treatment is most effective if we can do it as soon as possible. The problem is, the biggest problem we see is a delay in seeking care, okay? And it happens all the time. Uh, and uh, we had a case two weeks ago of a technical diver um, diving off the Jersey Shore. Uh, and these technical divers now are doing a lot of um, O2 decompression in the shallower. So he, he comes up after his, you know, 260 foot dives 30 minutes apart. He gets symptoms that may be DCS. He gets some paresthesias. He gets some joint pain. So, so did he seek help? No, he went to his garage where he had his 100% oxygen and he decided to breathe off of his oxygen bottle in his garage for a while, which made him feel a little bit better. So he decided not to call anybody. Well, he ran out of oxygen for about 30 minutes and then the next day the symptoms were worse. Did he call us that day? No, he called us on Monday. So it's these Monday, Tuesday DCSs. We get them all the time, right? I was diving on Saturday. This is what happened. And then they're calling you on Monday night you know, at midnight, like, thanks a lot, you know, well, what do I do now, right? So that happens all the time, over and over again to us. So we try to, uh, try to teach divers that if you have worrisome symptoms after diving, use your resources. The Divers Alert Network being a very important resource. People, someone will answer the phone at Dan 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you have a concern, don't go breathe your oxygen in your garage, give them a call and they can help you sort of manage the situation, okay? And don't wait to see what happens. 
All right, so you may, we may need to get you to the chamber once we've decided that we're worried about DCS. So we, and it may oftentimes require air evacuation. Um, we're fortunate at Penn. Steve Thom is the chief of hyperbaric medicine at Penn. He also happens to be the chief of Penn Star. So when I want to go get a diver, I call them and they, they just go do it because Steve's their boss. So I can send the helicopter wherever I want. I try not to abuse that too much, but I can send the helicopter. The, our, the helicopter crews know though when they're getting a diver that they want to fly as low as they possibly can. They're not going to be going up as high as they can uh, to try to reduce altitude exposure during the dive. And most fixed wing air ambulances are pressurized so that they minimize altitude exposure. All right, so now I've got the, uh, I've got the diver uh, now at my chamber and I need to get them treated. So I'm not gonna put anybody in the chamber, especially a diver who hasn't been screened for a pneumothorax. The only absolute indication for hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a untreated pneumothorax. So I have to make sure I don't think they have that. Make sure that they've been maintained on oxygen. And then the only other thing that I always make sure they do is take a leak before they go in the chamber because they're gonna be in there for a while, okay? All right, uh, I think Dr. Strauss, you're gonna do a pretty good talk on mono, treating DCI in monoplaces tomorrow. Affirmative. Yeah, right, so I don't need to do a lot on this. He's gonna be going crazy on this, but, but contrary to popular belief, DCI can be treated effectively in a monoplace chamber. You don't need to go to the big multi-place chamber where you go inside and watch TV and you know, sit in plush chairs. You can, it can be done in the, in the monoplace chamber. Um, so there, but there are some limitations that have to be sort of dealt with, and Dr. Strauss will talk about them too. One thing is that you are limited to what pressure you can go to. So you, you can't go deep if you wanna go deep when you treat these patients. Your limit's gonna be three atmospheres, which is the limit of most monoplace chambers. Um, depends on the monoplace chamber facility, but do, the question is, do they have air brake capabilities, okay? So, and why would we be concerned about air brake capabilities? Anybody have any? Okay, yeah, so, so, so neurological oxygen toxicity, you put your, put, put your diver in the chamber, you take them to 66 feet, you put them on oxygen, they have a seizure. If you can't air break them, what are you gonna do? And Dr. Strauss actually will talk about that uh, and, and, and whether or not we really have to worry so much about that and what to do in those situations, okay? And the obvious other problem is patient isolation. So you have a patient in a monoplace chamber, you can't lay your hands on them, so you better have done everything you wanted to do to them before you put them in, okay? Now, you do have treatment table options, and believe it or not, you can do a treatment table five or six in a monoplace chamber. Uh, it's a little uncomfortable for the diver because they can't sort of move around or sit up or anything like that. But uh, Dr. Strauss, you use the heart tr treatment tables frequently, so you, and he'll, you'll talk about those exclusively. exclusively. All right, so he's gonna give you a lot more data about the heart treatment tables, which you, which you don't have to be in for so long in the chamber for, okay? A heart treatment table, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't do monoplace, but it's three atmospheres for 30 minutes, and then 2.5 for 60, total of 90 minute treatment. And then the advantage of a, so I, I tell you about the limitations and I don't tell you about the advantages. The advantage to a monoplace chamber is you can treat the patient as frequently as you want to, because you don't have to worry about tenders going in with the, um, with the diver and whether or not they're gonna get decompression sickness or staffing issues. You can put that patient back in as many times as you want. So they can bring them back every eight hours or even shorter if they want to and, and do, do more dives on them. So you can do that as well. And Dr. Strauss will talk about those tomorrow with you. All right, but this is the world I live in. I, 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 I live in a much sloppier world where, where I can do whatever I want in multiplayer. So this is the chamber facility at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, it was built actually in 1968 as a research facility. So that's why it was kind of fancy. Um, and what we have is four separate chambers all connected together. It looks like a gerbil hamster habit trail. You know, you can crawl through them all if you want. You can pressurize them all and live in there if you want to. And we've done sat dives in there before. So um, we have chamber one here, okay? Uh, chamber one has two compartments, one A and one B. Um, we can fit, on our normal elective therapies, we can treat eight patients at a time in here, but we can do up to two critical patients simultaneously. We have set up for two critical patients if we have two intubated critical care patients at the same time. Uh, so that's compartment 1B. Compartment 1A is big enough to fit a litter into, and we can lock in and lock out. So we can take patients in or out without disrupting the dive that's underway. So that's compartment one, uh, or chamber one. Chamber two is directly in line with chamber one. And we have that one set up uh, all the time in case of an emergency. 
So free, more, more often than not, we will get an emergency during a regular day where we're treating regular patients over here. We don't want to have to abort that treatment in order to treat the critical patient that's come in. So this we can put them in chamber two with a separate tender. We can run that dive over there and we can do our normal day on the other side without interrupting anything. Chamber three is connected to chamber two. That's our high pressure chamber. We can go 2,000 feet with that. Um, we don't take patients there, that wouldn't be good. Um, it's mainly for research purposes, but also serves as egress. So if you need to get in and out of two while you're doing a critical patient in there, I can jump in three if the doc needs to go in and get in there and examine that patient. Chamber four sits below chamber two and that's our wet pod. We can fill it with water, put a diver in there and simulate diving activities at underwater and at pressure. So this is the chamber facility that I work at. All right, so I'm lucky I get, I get to play with this. All right. Okay, so treating DCS in multi-place chambers, uh, there are limitations, and we mentioned them before. The limitations are that we have to deal with our staff. There's a lot of decompression stra st stress on a staff member to do a table six. They come out significantly loaded with nitrogen and cannot dive again. So I gotta find somebody else if I get another emergency. So we have to make sure we have enough staff on. Advantages include the fact that I have hands-on care. I can go deep because we have mixed gas capability and we're trained to do so. So you can do other treatment protocols if you want. What are those, so what are the treatment protocols that you can do? So this is your, your regular old table six, the most common treatment you will get for DCS, unless you're at a monoplace facility, um, it, it, but you can do that at a monoplace as well, is the treatment table six, which runs 285 minutes, four hours and 45 minutes. You do have the option on a table six to do extensions at both the 60 feet and 30 foot, foot portions of that. So if you have a diver who hasn't responded or maybe partially responded, sometimes we'll, we'll pull the trigger and say, look, we're gonna extend another 20 minute oxygen session at 60 feet to see if we can get a response. So we're allowed to extend that and make that dive longer. Uh, US Navy treatment table five is more of historical significance. We used to divide decompression sickness up into type one and type two. If you had mild symptoms, you were type one. If you had more severe symptoms, you were type two. Why did we do that? We did that because back in the day, you said if you had mild symptoms, we can do a table, we'll just do a table five. And if you have serious symptoms, you'll do a table six. The problem with that became is that they were treating these folks with mild symptoms on a table five. They'd come out after the treatment and symptoms would recur. So, and then they'd be sort of chasing your tail after that. So yeah, I do a lot of preparing people for the undersea hyperbaric medicine board exam. We actually run a board review course um, up at Penn. Uh, and, and the board answer to this is that you never plan on doing a treatment table five. You start out planning on doing a treatment table six. If you have complete resolution of symptoms within 10 minutes of your tape table six, then you're allowed to switch to a table five. But if not, you're gonna just do your table six. So you always plan to do a six. You're allowed to back off to a five and we're always going in there asking the patient, you feel better, right? You feel better, right? Because we don't wanna be there for four hours. We wanna be there for 135 minutes instead of 285 minutes. No, we, we actually just take care of the patient. But, um, so that's the table five, which we don't use so much in multi-place chambers anymore. We're pretty much doing sixes. Now, depending on how sick your diver is and how significant the decompression stress was, there are people that would argue that a table six is not sufficient and that you may need to either treat the diver deeper or longer. So there are other treatment tables out there that people use. The commercial diving industry, Comex, commercial diving company, has Comex treatment table 30, where you go to 100 feet, 30 meters, okay? And when you're at 30 meters, you can't breathe 100% oxygen because you get toxic, right? So what you're gonna breathe is either a 50-50 mix of nitrox or helox, or actually you can get away with an 80% oxygen mix there without worrying about uh, oxygen toxicity. And then what happens is, is you do that deep portion of the table and then this slides into what looks very much like a table six, sort of a tail, tail end of it. So that's a COMEX treatment table. Um, treatment table 6A, um, what do we use 6As for? Really it was designed to be used for a cerebral arterial gas embolism. So we really don't use 6As so much for DCS, it's for cages. Although nowadays a table six oftentimes is sufficient for a cerebral arterial gas embolism as well. But I just throw it up here for completeness sake. And then you got the crazy Hawaiians, okay? So uh, the folks at, uh, at Hawaii, uh, Dick Schmerz and uh, F, uh, those guys out there developed their Hawaii deep treatment tables where they take you to 280 feet, okay, in the chamber. And you breathe uh, this 3565 nitrox and then they bring you back from that and that's a six hour and 40 minute table. And they feel that that may, 
from the, them looking back at their data, they feel that that may have better outcomes, although I think the jury's still out and people will argue about that. And it obviously takes a lot of uh, expertise to run a table like that um, and go that deep for treatment. But, it, but it's out there and that's, that's it, so you can see what it looks like. All right, so as the hyperbaric physician, I've got the patient in the chamber, I gotta worry about complications during treatment. So um, the good thing about divers is they already know how to clear their ears most of the time, so unless they're suffering from ear sinus problems, they're probably not gonna get an ear squeeze, but I'm gonna be worried about oxygen toxicity. Um, so I'm gonna be watching out for neurological oxygen toxicity while we're at the deepest portion of the dives, breathing 100% oxygen. Um, but then also, if I'm repetitively treating a diver and they're getting high FiO2s, they're breathing 100% oxygen while they're in the intensive care unit, over time they can get pulmonary oxygen toxicity, so I have to watch for that as well, okay? Tomorrow, when I talk about critical care, I'll talk about the management of neurological oxygen toxicity, like what do you actually do when they're in the chamber and they seize, and how do you continue treatment? I'll do that tomorrow with you, okay? Obviously, confinement anxiety can play a role. You could, a diver could, if they had a subclinical pneumothorax that you didn't pick up, you might make a pneumothorax worse. And then there are a couple of case reports of patients being treated with hyperbaric oxygen that develop pulmonary edema in the chamber. And there's also a very cool paper written by, by Lynn Weaver. Uh, again, this was in a monoplace facility, but a patient's getting paradoxical hypoxia during hyperbaric oxygen treatment. What was happening was, on a table six, when they got back to the shallower part, there are air brakes mixed in there. So what they had was they had a couple of critical patients that were requiring a high FiO2 before they went in the chamber just to maintain oxygen saturations or you know, oxygen levels. And when you put them on the air brake, when they were at the 30 foot portion of a table six and they did a blood gas, they were significantly hypoxic. So you can get paradoxical hypoxemia during hyperbaric oxygen therapy because in a table six, you do these air breaks and on the shallow parts of the air break, if that patient has a lot of pulmonary disease, you worry about that. All right, so what happens next uh, after you've been treated? Well, it depends on how severe your symptoms were and whether you got relief. So serious symptoms are incomplete relief. At my place, you're probably gonna get admitted to the hospital. You're gonna get some more workup neurologists will come see you, that kind of thing. Then they'll ask me what to do. Um, and then we may do tailing hyperbaric oxygen treatment. So we may treat you more than once. So we'll bring you back and do repeat treatments on you to try to get your symptoms to resolve. If your symptoms have completely resolved and we feel like you're okay to go home, we'll let you go home. We'll follow up with you very carefully. But in either case, it's, uh, you're never really done because if this diver wants to return to diving, you gotta make sure they get a, a really good medical evaluation before they return to diving. So, Returning to diving, symptoms must resolve completely. They can't have any residual symptoms. They need to be seen by a trained diving medicine physician to make sure that it's okay for them to return to diving who may order for further testing to be done to make sure that any pathology has resolved. And we may make recommendations to you as a diver on maybe how to change habits or dive more conservatively if you wanna return back to diving. Otherwise, I'm gonna be seeing you again at the chamber uh, in the future. So we'll make those recommendations for you. So in summary from my lecture, we, I think we know now that DCS is a clinical diagnosis. The story is critical to making the diagnosis. Many other diseases can mimic the symptoms and you have to keep those in the back of your mind as you're figuring things out. Denial and delay are big problems for us in trying to treat and resolve symptoms. Um, oxygen and fluids are primary treatment before you get to the hyperbaric chamber. We get you there as soon as possible to get you treated because our outcomes are better the sooner we can do it. And then make sure that you see a diving doc before you return to diving. And that's it.